Welcome back to the Prism Podcast. Today we have a couple that have made such an impact in my life. I'm so excited for you guys to learn from them. So James and Audrey McLeod, again, two of my dearest, dearest friends are relational leaders, they're business professionals and truly lovers of Jesus. And whenever one of me or my friends speaks to these two, we always leave the conversations and touch base with each other. And we're like, we feel, feel so filled by these two, their hearts, their spirits, and their willingness to just be total servant leaders. Um, they started in their early 20s and it grew their team to over 100,000 people in the network marketing space, leading and coaching rooms of thousands of people, um, really focused on marketing, sales, communication, and leadership. And we're actually celebrated as the youngest millionaires in a billion dollar wellness company at the ages of just 26 and 27. They met through the company. And since then, they've just expanded into um, especially relational you know, coaching and mentorship. And that's something that they're really focused on now. And so in this podcast, we dive into everything, marriage, building businesses while married, how to be in relationship with other people romantically and non-romantically, right? And really just like the critical skills that it takes to be in relationship with other people to communicate properly. And, you know, they've recently founded the McLeod Co. and are really excited for this new season of their life to pour really all of their skills and their expertise into enhancing marriages and family units while communicating and, and strategically guiding people through both emotional and mental complexities that we all, we all go through. So, so excited for you all to hear this episode. Again, two of my most cherished relationships in my life. I love these two so much and I'm so excited for you guys to learn from them. So we're going to dive right into James and Audrey McLeod's interview. All right, everyone, we are here today with two of my probably most significant relationships in my life over the course of the last five years. James and Audrey McLeod, who I met in the beginning of my journey of entrepreneurship. I think I met uh, Audrey originally at 22 years old. And I remember meeting both of you. And it was so special because it was the first time I had really seen young people creating something firsthand that was beyond just a nine to five, like really my first exposure to that. And you guys were leading and speaking and you were positive and you were confident and really like stepping into your power. And it gave me such a belief in myself that I could. And both of you guys are such bright lights, some of my dearest friends. And I've, I've, called you guys at some of the darkest points in my life and in my journey over the last five years. And you've been unwavering, truly unwavering in your support and your friendship and your love, no matter what the topic has been, you've invested time into me. And I just, I could cry thinking about how much you guys have done for me that you probably don't even realize, but I'm so excited to have you both on today. And I would love if you guys could just kind of introduce yourself, share your stories um, and then we can take it in and dive, dive into marriage and Jesus and all the things. So good. Well, we love, love you so much. And I remember meeting you specifically and being like, whoever this girl is, she is going to change the world. So mm -hmm. we are, we're very honored to be here. Very honored to, to have been asked to be here, but um, in regards to our story, there's so many things we can talk about. What specifics <laughs> yeah, we're, are we talking? A, what, okay. what part of our story are you wanting? Because there's a lot. Yeah, okay. What I would love to hear, because the, the two things that stick out to me are you, you both created a massive amount of success and impact at a very young age. So kind of the journey into that, but then also the journey of how you both met and what your relationship has transpired into, because I think both of you um, are such an example of what's possible in a relationship or in a marriage. So I would love to kind of hear both of those parts of the story. Well, that's, that's uh, we can dive right in. Dive in, go ahead. I began uh, my entrepreneurship journey um, in business when I was 22. I was open and exposed to the idea of living life by design. And when I heard that phrase and actually understood and saw how I could make that happen, I was all in. I became all in in a season of my life where I had just gotten out of a toxic engagement, actually. 
I did not was know engaged that. to be married. You did not know that. Well, I, I was no engaged idea. to be married and broke off the engagement five months before the wedding and dove straight into entrepreneurship and actually began that journey because I heard God tell me that if I did this, he would heal my heart. So I began my entrepreneurship journey with the sole purpose that if I gave and extended and served people, the Lord promised me that my heart would be healed in the process. I had no idea that through that process, I would end up meeting the absolute love of my life. Spoiler, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, and so I began my entrepreneurship journey of really diving into personal growth, of partnering with God first and foremost to become all that he had called me to be while also empowering other people and providing a service that created results, I mean, real results in people's lives. So seven months into my beginning and building and growing my business, I actually ended up meeting James's sister on a phone call where she was interested in the product and service that I was building. And through that, she had a transformation and invited me into her brother's home to share this with her friends. And so in I walked at 22 years old, seven months into my building my business in James's home. And it, and really that's the conclusion of it. No. That's where, <laughs> the end. That's happily where it all ever began. after. Yeah, happily ever after not. Um, from that point, there there's a, you know, a really beautiful story. But in terms of my entrepreneurship journey, it's pretty when you think about it, pretty wild to think about how we both started mm -hmm. really considering other ways of living life. For me as well, it came out of a, a place of pain. Um, I had been through the hardest semester in college uh, relationally. I had been through really some like really traumatic things. And I was at a place of openness where I just said, hey, I want to consider other things. Maybe the way that I've thought things should be done, could be done, needs to be reimagined. And I have always been one to think outside of the box. And so when this was presented to me initially, um, this way of building business, the way of designing a life, the product and service, you know, model in that sense, I was not, I was not open to it. I had a lot of pride, a lot of ego, like so much ego to fill the whole house up. <laughs> and it, how, how far did that take you? It took me <laughs> far enough to where I couldn't afford groceries at the end of the week. So you would dumpster dive for pizzas. I would dumpster dive for pizzas. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Uh, it's a true story. Um, so, you know, sometimes it was for fun to be, can be candid, but other times it was out of necessity because we were like, well, we gotta, we gotta need something. So, and that was what I knew, but I also knew that I wanted so much more and I believed that there could be something more. So um, I really decided to bet on myself and say, okay, I have a skill set. I have things that I can, you know, impart to people. I can help people. I can service people. Let's roll with it. So I actually started at 23. Um, after a couple of months of being around other entrepreneurs who were, you know, entrepreneurs are different. They think different, and most of the time they don't think just different. They think opposite. That mm -hmm. uh, I would say more traditional-minded people think, which isn't good or bad. It's just different. just different. And so it was very, it was really. Um, abnormal at first to hear the conversations that they were having. You know, Audrey, I remember three week, weeks into meeting her, she was like, Hey, well, like, what are you doing this weekend? Like, let's go to Hawaii or like, let's go to, let's just go to like the Cayman Islands or let's go to the Bahamas. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm, I'm in school. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, ah, just forget it. Like, just don't go. Like, let's just go. Come on. And I'm like, who is this person? And how are they, how is she seeing life like this? Mm -hmm. Everybody's living life Monday to Friday, <clears throat> Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday. Yeah. Spend what little money you have on drinks and food and then wake up on Monday feeling bleh again. This, she was like, let's go. It's Tuesday. Come on. Like, what, what are you doing next week? I'm like, I don't know, school. <laughs> and she was, she, she was so anti how she thought, but it was such a breath of fresh air. So kind of dovetailing into our relationship, there was an instant chemistry there. There was an instant connection. However, we both were at different points in our life where coming together in relationship just wasn't right at that timing. And the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And so timing is really, really key. And in the beginning, it, it just wasn't our time. It wasn't our timing. And we had that. It was like we were magnets to each other. Like in a room, we were always magnetized towards one another. And we tried to 
get together at different points and it did not work because again, the timing was right, was wrong. And so we really focused individually on building and growing our business so that we could live a life that was completely by our individual design. It Mm -hmm. grew to the point where I was making a multiple six figure income, became the top earner in my age bracket. James was growing, becoming one of the top earners in his age, in, in our age bracket. And we were really growing individually as people. It reached the point that we became more of best friends. And honestly, I did not ever think that James McLeod and I would ever ultimately end up getting married because at the point that we were at in our business relationship and in our personal relationship, we had such big extravagant dreams individually that we just became friends. And quite honestly, I didn't view him in the way that I once did when we first initially met and connected. And so how we ultimately ended up getting together was James James says that he felt a tug on his heart from the Lord Mm -hmm. and he began to pursue me just in the, the epitome of how you grow up as a girl when you dream of being pursued by your knight in shining, shining armor from the Disney movies to the Hallmark movies that, you know, you create this imagination of what it's going to be like to be swept off of your feet Well, James, when he made the decision that he wanted me, the pursuit of him going after my heart was not like the Disney movies or the Hallmark movie, but my gosh, it was what I had dreamed of and prayed for that a man would see the value of who I am and want it, Mm. like want it so much. And so I had a lot of fear I had a lot of intrepidation. I had a lot of stories wrapped around relationship based off of my previous engagement. I had a lot of reluctancy. And so James pursued me for eight months. We were best friends at the time, but for eight months, he kept on saying, let me take you on a date. Well, and and just to give some more color to that, it was not just eight months of like, hey, so do you like me yet? It was, it, I mean, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I would say at least three times where we would, we would, we weren't going on dates, but we were hanging out alone a lot. And, uh, I would, I would have a, you know, we'd be near the end of the night and they would just, I would just get really serious and say, look, like you're it for me. Like yeah. you're, you're it. Like I want, I want to pursue you. I care about you. I like you're everything I want. And, you know, to the point of bringing myself to tears yeah. and she just sitting there and then just shaking her head and saying, James, it's just never going to happen. And doing it like in love, she wasn't being mean, but she was like, I, it's just not going to happen. Well, I'm- And so it wasn't just, I want to give that color and yeah. depth because there was, a, I was putting my heart out there again and again. Really I'm saying, good. look, I'm not, the, I'm honing in on you and this, you rejecting me or telling me that you're too scared to date. Like <laughs> I'm going to wear you down, but it was a challenge. It was really challenging in that season in the sense that, I mean, you're putting yourself out there is sitting with somebody who knows you very well. We've had a, we'd have a really now a deep extensive friendship where we're communicating almost daily regarding business and, you know, social mm-hmm. other things. And I extend this continuously and it, and it continues not to land. There was a lot of fear there, but let me just point out to the women who are listening right now that are single, you deserve to be pursued relentlessly by a man that is willing to come after your heart. And if you are trying to pry words out of him or trying to get him to see you, he is not the right man for you. I wouldn't wear makeup. I wore sweatpants. James wanted me and was relentless in the pursuit of my heart. And so if there is somebody in your life right now that isn't giving you the attention that you deserve, he is not the right man for you, at least not right now. And so through the eight month period, as James was pursuing me, the thing that was stopping me was fear. But one of the really great things and one of the things that we did in our friendship before we officially became, you know, an item per se, was we kept our relationship and our friendship secret in the sense that 
I wasn't going and sharing with my girlfriends about James McLeod and what he was doing to pursue me. James wasn't going around sharing with his guy friends that he was pursuing me. Mm. We were figuring out between the two of us, how we really felt about each other. And so many times you can, you can get outside voices and outside sources, which, which cause confusion and, and creates a fog in your mind for you not to be able to figure out what it is that you really want. Now I'll, I'll add to that. It's not just a, Hey, I'm going to do this on my own. Forget everybody else. We were fervently praying and seeking the Lord in this. And if you don't know God, you don't know the Lord. I pray that you do. But having sound counsel is imperative because you also don't know your blind spots and you also may not be aware of the destructive behavior or patterns that you bring up in relationships. So not that we were naive to those, but to, to Odd's point, we weren't going and seeking out all these other people's opinions about what they thought about what we were pursuing and doing. It was really going to the heart of the father and saying, Lord, you know, for me, it was a done deal. I was like, I, I had, I had already pushed this girl off. I didn't, I said, we're never going to be together. I had told her that earlier in our relationship. Like we're never going to be together. This is never going to happen ever. And I meant it to now where I'm like, this is, she's it. So I had that resoluteness in myself. I didn't need confirmation for anybody else. I didn't need, you know, I didn't, what did I need? This was my relationship. And so just to kind of put that, right. Um, you know, so ultimately, after eight months, I said, okay, let's do this thing. And we were engaged five months later, married six months after that. And oh it's been God. honeymooning forever. And we <clears throat> are on the, the belief system for our marriage that we are going to continue to fall deeper in love, have more fun, adventure, and thrive and honeymoon for the rest of our lives. So that's our story. <laughs> I, I love that you touched on the pursuit, Audrey, because I was going to ask you about that because you and I have talked about that so many times. Like if you don't have someone who is like banging down your door to be around you and to be with you, it's not the right person. And that's such, such, such a standard. I think women, we get to like up the ante for men to meet that standard of what, you know, what we accept in our lives. And James, it's, it's, I mean, beyond just like the calling that you had from God, what was it that had you continue to pursue? Because when someone, you know, women are usually afraid to shut somebody down because they won't continue to try. That's right. But I'm curious what had you continue for eight months? Well, let me try. just tell you what the, the switch that happened was her continuing to live her life. Mm. And it took her from going little East Tennessee, flying all the way to Australia and me watching her continue to live her life for me to go, this girl's, you know, guys, we want, it's innate in us. We want a chase. We want a challenge. We want something to conquer, to pursue. God put it in there. Women aren't items. They're not objects, but there is something in the heart of man that wants to pursue, to chase down, to, you know, wrap up in their arms uh, in a really like loving, strong, dominant way. And if you have somebody that's just like sitting at your feet being like, okay, like, can you pick me up yet? Like, can you, are you, are you ready? That is like just a, it's, it's a repellent for mm -hmm. me and most men, I would say men that are really walking in identity. So when she, when she just was like, Hey, I'm gone. I'm out living my life, doing my thing. I got a glimpse of life without her. Mm -hmm. And you know, the friend zone, mm, it really is, does not exist for very long in adult, you know, opposite yeah. sex relationships. It does not because there either is an attraction or not. And, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is. We're, we're, we're sexual mm -hmm. beings in that sense. It's like, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. So when I envisioned her, my life without her, I just, I felt this great loss. And, and really I said, okay, she's not going to just sit and wait around. She's going and doing things. She's living and everything shifted in me at that point. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, like I'm, I'm going, this is a priority. She is it. So I knew at that point, it was in November or the beginning of December, where I, I, the first time I said, look, I, I like you. I'm, I'm like, I'm into you a lot. And she was like, nah, not happening. Like, see ya after Christmas. And, but from that point, it continued. I was not, I was not moving at all. Um, so you just had a resolute. It was, it was a, it was a settledness that I had been around her enough. I had been alone with myself. I had considered, I had prayed deeply into and I said, this is it. And until she goes off and marries another man, I am going to pursue her. 
She can tell me no, that's fine. It doesn't matter. But like until she's at an altar, I mean, even engagement's not married, people. It's not. Totally. Like, I'm not saying go in and like wreck engagement. I was engaged, but like, we didn't get married. <laughs> yeah. Not, it's not done until it's done. And yep. so that was just my, that was my perspective. And I also had been around her enough to know there was some stubbornness, there was fear, there was reluctancy in not that regard. me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never. And, and it, it really, I mean, goodness, like, like she said, men, you, you are called and commissioned to pursue, to leave and cleave, to leave and go find and go search out a wonderful, you know, admirable, noble woman and, and just God, chase her down. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. And, and women, you deserve to be pursued in that way, like 100,000%. Um, and so her, her going on and continuing to live her life, not waiting around for me is what pushed that, you know, it sparked, it sparked that innate, you know, driving me to go and do that. I want to talk about that in the world of marriage, continuing to grow each of yourselves. That's something I see really deeply in both of you. And something I've learned from your modeling is the continuation of personal growth as an individual within a marriage or within a relationship. Can you talk about that? Because I really believe that that might be one of the keys to you honeymooning forever, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on your thoughts around that and maybe advice for people who feel like the second they get in a relationship, they get codependent and they don't continue to grow themselves? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you said that because marriage is the greatest gift that God could ever give us. I really believe that. And we have been married for six beautiful years and we are thriving the most we've ever thrived in our marriage today. And the first couple years of our marriage, we were figuring out how we wanted to do marriage, how we wanted to communicate in marriage, how we wanted our patterns to be in marriage, what are our new habits that we're creating. And we had a lot of codependency in the beginning of our marriage with each other without even realizing what it was that we were doing, without even realizing that James felt like his, my happiness was dependent upon what he was doing to create happiness inside of me, which put pressure on him, which caused him to be a little bit more snappy, which caused me to be frustrated. And then it was just this mm -hmm. ever revolving cycle. So when you can understand that your spouse is not here to make you happy. Okay. James is not here yeah. to make me happy. He is a beautiful counterpart. He is my greatest gift from above. He is, he is a wise counsel. And in many ways, he's Jesus in the flesh to me here on earth. But if I am to seek James for affirmation, for approval, for happiness, for comfort, for security and all the things, then I am misplacing the order that God created life to be. The order is that I would find security, hope, happiness, faith, trust in God and God alone. And then everything from that point is just a bonus factor. And so there are times in relationship that the order of things can get messed up depending on how heavy is your business mode right now. Are kids a factor in it? Um, how are your stress levels right now? All of these things can play a role in the way that you communicate with your spouse. But what James and I have been so committed to from the very beginning of our marriage is we are committed to growth, period. So we broke the pattern of codependency and really leaned upon the dependency of God, the father, and only him to meet every need that we, that we have. From that place, our relationship began to thrive so much more from that deep understanding. And it released both of us into being more of who God called us to be individually. James always says, we always say, you can't pour from an empty cup. If I'm not getting filled from God first, getting filled from him first, what do I have to offer? Mm -hmm. Nothing. And so the biggest, most amazing point of us filling ourselves up first is it broke that codependency and allowed more for freedom to flow throughout our relationship. You know, 
one of my biggest fears and reluctancy in getting into a relationship with James is I had an entire belief system wrapped around how I would be trapped based off of my previous experiences. There's also so many things that the world is throwing at you when it comes to marriage specifically, how, oh, it's a ball and chain. Oh, things are going to be so hard. Well, why do they have to be? You have to ask yourself these questions because your belief system is so much wrapped around what you, what you saw modeled to you and the things that are constantly being spoken over you, right? Yeah. So with James and I, we are so committed to growth that we really began to dissect and say, what is the belief system that we really want in our marriage? Mm. James, do you have anything you want to add to that? That was beautiful on. Growth equals progress and progress equals happiness. Mm -hmm. If you're not progressing, you're not happy. And most people enter marriage as that's the finish line saying, all right, I got married, I'm done. And they coast first year. It's just like the freshman 15, the first year 15, <laughs> where you become, you become lazy. Yep. You're like, oh, I don't have to try anymore. I locked it down. The guy starts to grow out all his hair. He loses, he stops going to the gym. The wedding bod is like swings to the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> the girl never puts her hair up, never like gets like sexy or beautiful for him. Cause she's like, mm -hmm. Hey, I, I did it. Like I'm done now. And there is a spirit of complacency that falls upon couples when they get mm -hmm. married, where not that that didn't, you know, weren't tempted by that at certain points. But when we got married, there was, we both had the outlook that this is just the beginning. We had waited for this. We, we, we were so desirous of this covenant. Now it's here. Now we get to build something together. Mm -hmm. And that is highly personal. It is a, it is a personal responsibility. This isn't, this isn't me bringing 50 and odd bringing 50 to equal 100. It's I'm bringing 100%, she's bringing 100%, which is why the unity of marriage is so amazing because then you get 200%. But if mm -hmm. I'm bringing 2% and I'm expecting odd to fill my other 98%, then things are, like she just said, are completely misplaced. And so mm -hmm. that personal responsibility, people, the, the marriage isn't the savior. Your spouse is not the savior. Yeah. And, and, and if you treat them like they are, you will crush them and you will bury them in your expectations and then your overcriticalness of how they are not meeting those expectations. And the last thing that I want to say is, is James and I have been entrepreneurs building businesses for a decade now. Okay. We have read personal growth books, personal development books, changing your money mindset, how to grow more wealth, what to do to get ahead, all of the things that you can possibly think of to fill your cup. And while those things are important to grow your life and to move your life forward, the only thing that is truly going to fill up a person's cup and bring them to the level that of their highest, I mean, I'm talking their peak potential in life is to dive deep in their relationship with God first. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what your belief is, it doesn't matter. This is absolute truth. And this is what we yeah. can stand on. This is what we base our entire life on. We've had different seasons where we've dove so deep in personal growth and the spiritual component of our relationship with God was a little lax. And let me just tell you, there wasn't as much thriving mm. in our marriage, in our personal life and in our business life as it was when the order of God first, everything else comes after that. When that order is stays at the very top, our marriage thrives, our business flop thrives, money flows in and out more easily, mm. more effortlessly, because it's the way that God ordained it to be. So good. It's so powerful. You guys are, you guys are so awesome. <laughs> you already know that. And, you know, I mean, we could dive into like being, you know, married as business partners. That's a whole other conversation. But what I think is a really important thing to talk about and something that you, one of you had mentioned, I think it was you, James, that you, you know, it was odd, sorry, you got married and then you started to work on a lot of these things of how you wanted your marriage to look and all of that. What advice would you give to, would you give people the advice to do that before you get married, to get clear on all of what you want your marriage to look like? Like what, what's the frequency of those conversations that's healthy? How do you, you know, sit down with a partner who, may not be as open to communicating all of these things. Like what advice do you give to the people that you work with who are going to get married, who are married to actually shift the conversations to actually having conversations and from living a life of just like autopilot reactivity into an intentional 
marriage and relationship? You know, I would, I would say that hindsight's 2020, like what James and I are walking in today. I really wish that there were other young couples that we, that were bold enough to speak about the things that James and I are really speaking about right now. And one of the things that I would go back to my younger self, even when James and I were dating would be to speak in rigorous honesty with each other to speak openly and honestly about how you feel, what you want, how you want your communication patterns to be, and to open up the conversation in honesty versus, you know, trying to say the right thing that might make you look good to your partner, or you're just saying something because that's what you heard your parents say growing up, or that's what you saw modeled to you when you had growing up. I didn't understand that so much of my belief system wrapped around communication, so much of my belief system wrapped around marriage was programmed by the things that I saw and events that have taken place in my own life. So if I had somebody at some point to be able to break those things down for me, then James and I would have been able to bypass a lot of the disconnect that we had early on in our marriage. But these things weren't spoken about. Nobody sat me down and talked to me about rigorous honesty, about identifying negative patterns, about identifying communication styles. And that's why today James and I are obsessed and are called to talk about the things that we've never heard people talk about. Well, and to talk on the, to, to speak to the point of like how frequently and where in the relationship, relationships are so multidimensional. There's all sorts of relationships, um, relationship styles, relationships, beliefs, how, how long do you date before you get engaged? How long do you get engaged? Like, and we're not about to impose what, you know, the right or wrong way in that, you know, those areas are, cause they're highly personal. However, if you're, <laughs> If you're getting together with someone who is excited about life, who is more excited about the future than they are in the past, they're not just like, oh man, do you remember like when we were like in high school and like how great that was? And like, they're mm -hmm. always going back to the past as if those are the good old days that can never be matched. First mm -hmm. off, that's a sign. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe reevaluate. But that to me expresses openness. And while Odd and I, I cannot say that we have been always open. We've put our feet down and our, our, we've, we've clashed heads of like, no, it's this way. And she's like, no, it's this way. Right. And what we found is that through our journey, when we both come open and when we both come humble and honest and honest mm -hmm. to a particular topic, whether that's, you know, how do we want to do marriage, which is a huge <laughs> t topic, but yeah. maybe what are some words that you associate with marriage? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a conversation right there that you can really start to gauge if you're not married yet, there's only so much you can see. It's just like having a, a, a baby. We had Maverick 20 months ago. And so there was so much that we didn't know. We didn't know. And on yeah. this side of marriage, you might not know all the, the, the questions even to ask, but you can really get a gauge of, hey, what are some words you associate to marriage? And if they're like hard, frustrating, um, controlling, controlling, entrapping. Mm. Okay. Well, then, then you ask a deeper question. You say, okay, well, what what has happened in your life that has led you to believe those things? Well, you know, I saw my mom and dad, they were fighting all of the time and X, Y, and Z. And then, and then, you know, maybe they split up and I just felt abandoned and, and it felt confusing. I don't even know why people get married anymore. Nobody stays married, but you get to understand mm -hmm. where that belief and that framework through which you're now seeing all of marriage through. Mm -hmm. And you can say, okay, well, if we come together, what sort of marriage would, you like us to have? What words would you like to associate through a marriage that you get to create? Because that's the thing that we always, we always had that perspective. We get to create a marriage. We get to create our, our habits, yeah. our rituals, our traditions. We get to create all that. Now we're byproducts of two sets of parents and two family units that are dysfunctional. Everyone's is, but we get to choose and take responsibility. So that's how I would encourage starting those conversations of like, Hey, how do you feel about the topic of marriage? Where's like the, you know, maybe some of your fears regarding marriage mm -hmm. and, and then flipping the script and saying, what are you most excited about? What have you seen to be most fruitful in marriages that you've witnessed? And what would you like to implement in your own marriage? 
that's a great place to start in any relationship with the, whose sites are on marriage that will facilitate that conversation and not have it get too heavy or too intense because it really quickly can. And if you're not engaged or close to that time frame, you know, you don't want to ask and like deep dive on questions that maybe are a little bit premature um, mm-hmm. or, you know, way too hypothetical. So that would be how I would answer that question. So good. And it seems like you guys have done such a great job of like redefining exactly what your marriage is and what it means to you and making it your own and not just following the conformity and the stories of what you may previously have believed or what others have told you to believe. And I think that's, that's the magical thing about it is it doesn't all have to look a certain way. Not everyone gets engaged in the same amount of time. Not everybody gets married the same amount of time. It's the same in a marriage. Um, I'm curious with Maverick being in the picture now for the last 20 months, how has your marriage changed in ways that you didn't expect? Honestly, um, we're more connected and we communicate far better today than we did before Maverick was here. Mm. We're living our life and our marriage so much more intentionally because there is another little person in the picture. Mm. And James and I talk about, I mean, there are, there are aspects. We always, we evaluate our marriage and check into our hearts very consistently because it's the most important thing to us. So there are aspects where we've identified and we've said, okay, right now it feels like fun date nights are being neglected. Let's book a babysitter specifically tomorrow. So now we have a babysitter tomorrow. We're always identifying the places and areas that we can grow in. So with Maverick being in the picture, there are really great things that have transformed. We're more connected. We communicate better and stronger. We are far greater with our time. My gosh, I thought I was a great time management. We thought we were killing the game in our business before. No, now it's like, oh, we've got time management on lockdown. Mm. And on the other aspect of areas that we can grow in, at times, because he is 20 months old and he obviously needs to be taken care of a lot, it date nights can seem to be something that can be lacking. So we are committed. Mm. The word is committed. We are so committed to the growth and the progress of each other that that's been an area that we've had to focus on more with and, him being in the picture. And like marriage, we, we were very highly conscious of the story that we created four weeks, no, maybe a little bit more than that. After he was born, we went on a trip and Mm -hmm. we were like, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how this is going to go, but like, gosh, darn it. We're not, (laughs) we're not not buying into the story that now we're, we're landlocked or we can't go anywhere or traveling with a kid is hard. we got to learn something new. So like, let's just put him in the car and see how it goes. And, you know, I'm proud of us for that. Me too. Because it's easy, it's easy to stay complacent it's easy just to, just to not try to not apply yourself, but it's so unfulfilling and it's not what you were created to do. And there's a slow degradation of everything in your life. When you just allow yourself to be really moved by the wind Mm -hmm. of what, you know, opinions or perceptions or experiences of other people are. So we were really intentional with that. Not to say that there weren't times where we've looked at each other and been like, I miss you. Like mm-hmm. you can't just stand in the kitchen now for an hour and have a long conversation. We got Maverick wanting to go play outside and he wants mm-hmm. to play with his toy. And, you know, he's not annoying and he's not, he's a kid. Yeah. And it's being conscious of the words that we use to describe what is happening. But we have looked at our, each other and been like, man, I miss you. And, you know, there are times where we miss times where we could just sit and prolong, you know, prolong states and, and talk. But now we get the opportunity to create those times and be much more intentional, which in all actuality, Sydney, is, has made all of those moments so much more precious. And yes. I hope for so many people to, to experience that understanding that you're not losing anything. You're actually adding mm-hmm. a deeper level of gratification for that which you already have. And the mm-hmm. things in our life can help accentuate and bring that up. Well, and you know, biblically, like we're meant to go from glory to glory. And if you take that and apply that to your own life, like we're meant to go from glory to glory. Like James and I, our marriage is more rich today with a child than it ever was before. Mm. We stand on the belief that life is always getting better and better and better. We're always growing closer and closer and closer. The words that you speak become your reality. God spoke 
God spoke the world into existence through his words. We speak through our words. We speak into existence, our world. Mm -hmm. So what are you choosing to speak forth out of your mouth about your relationship? What are you choosing to declare and stand on? What belief systems are you declaring out of your mouth and creating? We are constantly evaluating where we're at all of the time so that we can continue to compound and grow where we're at today so that our future looks brighter than it does in our present moment. Mm. It's so funny. I was going to talk to you guys about the power of our words and, uh, you know, all, all these different things that they, because you guys live it, you guys live it so truly like behind closed doors. But what I love watching, even just from afar, because I haven't gotten to meet Maverick yet, is that you guys didn't let Maverick stop the life that you were living. You're letting him be involved in it. And because of that, he seems like the happiest, <laughs> joyous, probably not all the time, but one of like that kid is going to grow up to be in such a healthy, happy home mm -hmm. because of the intention that you guys are putting into your mm -hmm. marriage and into your business and into your parenting and into your life. And it's mm -hmm. so inspiring to watch because it's so different than what 99% of people are doing. Mm -hmm. And and I just want to acknowledge you guys for that. I'm not a parent. I'm not even a wife, but <laughs> not even a girlfriend, but, <laughs> but it, watching you guys go through this journey is so beautiful. And I can't wait to be on it myself. Um, but I want to, I want to talk about Thrive, but the last question I have for both of you guys is what is like one or two of the key ingredients to be a part of a healthy and really fulfilling and enriching marriage if you could like boil it down to one or two things humility it's what I was gonna say oh uh, so connected guys are on the same page though that's good humility and honesty those are literally the two that I was about to say we're so in love <laughs> oh my gosh I was like I'll just say the other one I'll just say honesty <laughs> no but that's that's what it is it's it's humility and, and honesty when you come to a conversation or relationship with pride and ego you're not going anywhere. You're either right or you're in connection. That's the mm -hmm. truth. And when you come humble, maybe, maybe your way isn't the right way. Maybe your way isn't the only way. Is there a new creative place? And then you're also honest enough, not just with your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, but with yourself, mm -hmm. honest with yourself about the things that you want, the things that matter to you, the things that you haven't acknowledged or let go of, the things you're refusing to um, heal from, that's where real, real richness in relationship is found through honesty and through humility. It, it will change everything. Mm -hmm. So good. Um, you guys just started in the eight week program, a marriage mm -hmm. experience, and mm -hmm. it's called thrive. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're going to be doing more than one, but I would love if you can share because there's, I mean, I could have you guys on for another three hours. We could just talk about so many things because there's so much wisdom outside of just marriage that you guys have, but I think a good opportunity for people to learn more from you guys is this experience. So yes. where can people like find you? How can they work with you? How, how can they be a part of thrive? Is it ongoing? Give all the details. Yes. Okay. Well, first let me just, let us just share a little bit of where thrive came into play. We've been in love with each other and passionate about marriage from the very beginning we craved a space and a place to have community with other young couples that all desired more thriving adventure, fun connection that viewed marriage through the lens of life giving, that view marriage from the lens of wanting it to continue to get better and better and better. Obviously there's challenges, there, it's relationship, but we wanted that community. We wanted a structure that would help us dive into negative patterns to build new healthy ones. And there wasn't anything like that out there. So we created it. And that's where Thrive really came into play was that God laid it on our heart to put something together like this because it's something that we so deeply desired for so long. Well, and it, it, he put it on our heart when we first got married and mm. we said, we, we we're going to create something for marriage because, you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty bizarre thing when you're married and you've gotten married with somebody else, like around the same time. And then you witness that person go through a divorce. Like that's a pretty jarring experience. And I remember that. And 
Yeah. Like Odd said, we wanted to create a community, but at the same time, we're not going to start marriage and you know have this authority of like, look what we've done. We've been married for two weeks. Like, come on, you don't have any authority yet. Like you just started. So while we knew that this was a seed in our hearts, we also wanted to walk in wisdom to say there, let's, let's lay some groundwork. Let's do some hard work. We've invested thousands, like so much money into ourselves when it comes to personal development, mm -hmm. um, internal work, relational work, all, all of it. And we work together. So, I mean, throw that in there um, yeah. to where it got to a point, you know, a couple months ago where we just said, we, this cannot be pushed off anymore. The world mm -hmm. needs this. And we believe that we believe that relationships need this. We believe marriages need this and we need this. We're kind of doing it selfishly for us too, because we want to grow. We're, Brings being back to center, by yeah. it. we're being refined by it. We're being encouraged. And I mean, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to live out in a healthy, thriving relationship with their best mm -hmm. friend? Like who doesn't want that? I don't know, right. but that's, that's what that? it is. So this eight week, this eight week experience is all about that a creating a community of people who are married or in relationship and are wanting more out of it. They're coming mm -hmm. open, honest saying, Hey, we haven't figured it all out, but we're hungry to grow and really breaking down into di eight different modules regarding communication, um, parental upbringing of how you were brought up in your family unit and how that yeah. contributes to the way you communicate now in relationship, dealing with all sorts of different areas to really empower, equip, and give practical tools for people in relationship that they can apply and as a byproduct thrive, not just in their marriage, but in every other area of their life. And what we've seen is, is that when our marriage is thriving, every other area of our life is. I said that earlier on this podcast is that it overflows into every single area. And so like James says, we have eight specific modules to evaluate where you're at today, to envision where you're going, to break down your family dynamic, to break down communication styles, to teach you practical application of what healthy communication looks like and to guide you in incorporating that into your daily life with your partner to speak about what it looks like when you get in dynamic conversations. Mm. We don't ever say we fight. We talk about dynamic conversations. I love that. That's great. So we talk about what does it look like to enter and to engage in a healthy dynamic conversation because you're going to have those in your relationship. And then once that break happens, how do you rebuild connection mm -hmm. when you have that? So we dive into rebuilding connection. We dive into the psychology of creating and having fun in your relationship. We give activities each yeah. week to incorporate into your relationship and your marriage that you can focus on, that you can grow in. So, and then, you know, we have building a life together and what that looks like and how to grow in building a life together, identifying what it is that you exactly want, breaking off old patterns, engaging in new healthy ones. So we launched Thrive, our eight week marriage experience. So much more to come from this. The couples are already experiencing massive breakthroughs, some of the best conversations that some of them have ever had that and that specifically came from a couple that had been married for 12 years wow specifically came from a couple that's been married for 12 years and so and these groups right now are intimate um yep. and so we will have to answer your question we have more that's coming this is something that we are now pursuing in a really big yeah. way but we want them to remain intimate and so there's going to be a cap on these groups because that's where a lot of the depth is is facilitated mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so if people are interested in it, listening to this, I would just encourage you to, you know, we're most present on Instagram, um, at James McLeod or Audrey McLeod and, or Audrey, Faye. Audrey Faye. and, um, just DM us the word thrive or say, Hey, I heard you on the podcast. We'd love to talk more and we can get you in the next one. Uh, assuming it's not Amazing. filled up. Right. We, we have a wait list that we've started. So if it's something that you're interested in, you can DM the word thrive and we'll give you the information and put you on the wait list and you will get, be the first to know when the next thrive experience takes place. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, it, it's fun to talk to you in a more formal setting just because I'm used to yeah. like FaceTiming you guys and no makeup <laughs> on. So right, it's, right. it's been such a, a pleasure to, I mean, hear even more about your stories. And every single time I speak with you guys, I learn so much, not just about marriage or whatever the topic is, but truly, like you said, Audrey, like how Jesus walked in the form of human beings. And 
that's something that's so special to me and so sacred to me that both of you represent. So I love you guys mm. so much. We um, love you. And you're welcome back anytime on the podcast. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.